BFM 89.9, I'm Cam Ruslan and you're listening to A Bit of Culture, the show where each week three people talk about cultural matters. And, and also this week you can watch us talk about cultural matters by uh, looking up the video on the website. And this week you may hear from the sound quality, something's a bit different. That's right folks, we're not in Malaysia anymore. We're in Singapore. And so we're going to have a Singapore-themed show. And with me is regular Sherrod Kooten. Always a pleasure. You're an old Singapore boy, aren't you? Uh, yeah, 14 years. That's right. And, excitingly, uh, Malaysian playwright, Husea Suleiman. Very happy to be here. And Husea, you I'm sure a lot of you will remember from uh, the 90s and so, uh, playwright, <laughs> he... Well, it's been a while now. It has. I've, I mean, I've been, I've been in Singapore since 2001, so it's my 12th year, really. Wow. Because uh, you'll remember uh, Atomic Jaya, uh, Election Night. Election Day. Election Day. I, I preferred Night, quite frankly. I thought it was a much better version. Uh, and uh, a whole host of other plays. Have you been writing plays in Singapore? I have. Um, with my wife, Claire Wong, we run uh, Checkpoint Theatre, which celebrated its 10th anniversary season last year in 2012. Um, and my collected plays, 1998 to 2012, is coming out in June, God willing. So I'm sort of finalizing the manuscript now, looking back at, at uh, what is it, 15 years of, of writing for the stage? Mm -hmm. Not a lot. I mean, I, I wrote a lot more in KL. Mm -hmm. um, when I came to Singapore and I started uh, teaching playwriting as well at, at, at National University of Singapore, I found that I, would, I took great pleasure in young playwrights saying all sorts of interesting things and finding their own voice. So I thought, well, so long as other people are doing good theatre, I'm happy. I don't have to say it. But yes, I'm a playwright. I'm still a playwright. Um, uh, working on plays now. Uh, I also run Studio Wong Hazir, which is a creative consultancy. Um, I publish Postcode uh, SG, Postcode Singapore, which mm -hmm. is an online magazine about yeah. contemporary Singapore. Um, and I teach playwriting. So no, no plans to uh, come back to KL? Um, actually, we're always talking about bringing a show up to KL. You um, haven't for a long time. Yeah, well, we, we did a show with Jo Kukutas last year. She acted in the 10th anniversary production of my play Occupation, and Claire directed her in that. Oh. So she came down and she um, did a show which, which was you know, popular and critical success in, in August of last year. And so we've been talking to Jo about bringing that to KL. Okay. Um, so yeah, you know, God willing, in the, in the near future, you'll, you'll, you'll uh, see something of mine back there. Yeah, excellent. Good, I hope so. Because we, we, yeah, I mean, there was a time when you know, watching the new Hoosier show was uh, was a, a thing to do. Uh, there's one line I always remember. I've got, I've got to say, I've always wanted to say this line from <laughs> Atomic Jaya. Funniest line Hoosier ever wrote, anybody wrote, was, um, was it? Uh, Chinese does the work, uh, Malay gets the credit, Indian gets the blame. And, and uh, it cranks me up. Anyway. Every time. Every time. Every time. Every time you say it. <laughs> Every well, not when I, yeah, well, it's better when he said it. Anyway, so our three topics for discussion are parallel lives. Topic number two, the making of alternative culture. And finally, topic number three, Malaysian abroad. So uh, we're in Singapore. Unlike Husea and uh, Sharad, I don't really have much of a Singapore connection, but Sharad asked me to think of my, my Singapore connection. The first thing that came to my mind was many years ago, uh, we were staying in the Raffles Hotel, you know, as one does. Uh, but this, this was in the, the, the old Raffles pre-facelift. Uh, and it was very nice, but it was very run down. And it, I, whilst I was staying there, I got a phone call from my mother telling me that I had failed my A-levels. Um, and that was just very abrupt, the end of one life, the end of my academic career, which could and should have been glorious. <laughs> and... Later, a few years later, I was in another hotel, the E and O in Penang, you know, as one does. And I was—I remember explaining to my brother there what I was doing in England. This is before I came back to Malaysia. And as I was explaining it to him, I realized it sounded absolutely stupid. I was clearly wasting my time in England, and I decided to return to Malaysia after having lived in England for 20 years. So. I, I, I built up this catalogue of parallel lives in my life. I, feel, I can't help but wonder, what if I had stayed in England? What would I be doing now? My friends are doing very well. Um, what if I had somehow managed to apply myself and become academic, which I'm not? And 
the, the, these parallel lives stay with me, and I think about them quite a lot. And I'm just wondering now, in my art, in my work, am I trying to simply uh, achieve the impossible by achieving those parallel lives, as opposed to my own life? And I, I look at, sometimes I look at politicians, I look at other artists, and I wonder, they seem to be lecturing us a little too much, and I'm just wondering if they're trying to make us achieve something impossible to become something which we are not. Just coming back to the question of, you know, when you think about that, the, those possibilities that were missed, do you, is it with a kind of, uh, kind of whimsical sense that, oh, it could have been this, it could have been that, or is it a deep sense of regret that if, if only I had stayed the course, you know, uh, gone back and done the A-levels again and passed and gone through, uh, that I would have been a great success? Is there a fantasy quality to this parallel life? I mean, well, uh, uh, occasionally, we, we don't want to be, you know, talking too much about my own stuff, but occasionally, yeah, when I, I went back to England, I met this old friend of mine, he's doing so well, and I just thought, and he and I were exactly the same, we were sort of lounging around, uh, doing absolutely nothing, and uh, he's doing so well, and I keep thinking, my God, how did he do that? I could have been doing that, so... Uh, so there is a fantasy quality about <laughs> well, a self-reproaching quality. But I'm just wondering: do we, mm. the three of us around this table? I mean, we we've lived in different countries, which is something we'll talk about in a moment. But do do we do you, for instance, who's here, imagine that parallel life of you if you'd stayed in KL? Sorry. Huh. Um, yes, but. I mean, I, I, I was just thinking as, as you were talking that your, your way of looking at it sort of assumes that you make a choice and then you are locked into a certain track of life, right? Um, but actually, I think that, that the times we live in now are more accepting of uh, multiple careers, what they now call the portfolio career. They're more accepting of um, living in different places, living in uh, apparently several places at once, commuting in the course of a year. Uh, they're more accepting of reinvention in a way. So actually, you're at probably the stage in your life where you have the resources and the maturity and the and the, the, the sense of groundedness where you could actually you could actually do that. You could actually have, let's say, a film career in England, or you could go and pursue you know a graduate degree in something. Um, at this stage, and you can now, you can now at this point in history and at this point in your life. And so I'm thinking maybe that's a, it's a false opposition that we, you know, that when we're not locked into one thing, maybe now it's about freeing ourselves from that very sort of pre-war sense of your destiny, this is your career path, right. you work for one employer, you know, collect your pension and then, then you die. Right. Right. Um, now but the thing I guess is that with Cam's own conception of the parallel lives, is that there are certain possibilities that are foreclosed to you. That, you know, having left uh, the, the, the scholastic trajectory that he was on, you know, not getting a university degree means that then you can't sort of put your foot into, you know, you can't move into certain types of activities and it's just sort of like, okay. Or yeah. if you move a country, you just don't have the opportunities anymore. Yeah, but, yeah, but the, so who's here suggesting though that uh, you can get back on and you can in fact live these parallel lives you can live multiple lives mul yeah. on multiple trajectories yeah or, 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 or one's life now is necessarily blended or is accepting of m what would have in previous times been considered mm. separate tracks yeah yeah right. yeah yeah okay yeah, I, I take your point and, and yes I could go off and do that graduate degree which is I, it makes me laugh actually the thought of it. But you know you're right. I could do that. But um, but did, are there, are there places though in in that are, are utterly unfulfillable, that untouchable, where um, you know some things happen and you can never get to that place, and that they inhabit this ghostly zone. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking specifically of my father. My father died when I was very young, and so um, you know what if. What if he had not died? You know, that that parallel life. So that, I mean, that mm. I can't do anything like about that. Yeah. But we have to distinguish between the things that you can't do anything. I mean, like circumstances of our birth, right? Mm. Or, or, or things that happened to, that were imposed on us, and things that uh, 
consequence of choices that we made. So for instance, when you got the news that you failed your A-levels, um, you could, as many people do, just apply yourself and reset, right? mm, and then mm. maybe get through the second or the third or whatever time, right? Mm. And then you could, in theory, still have gone on and had a career in, in, mm, in mm. academia or the professions or whatever. Um, but it's actually more of a choice to say, okay, well, didn't get through this time round, I'm going to actually choose uh, a different path. Mm, right? mm. So the sense of, 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 of the turning point, I think, is the voluntary one. That's what you're talking about. Yeah. So what, what yeah. if, you, when you, if you hadn't chosen to come back uh, from England after having had that sort of embarrassing conversation with your brother. Yeah. yeah. See, that's very interesting. You're kind of giving very practical, pragmatic advice, very Singaporean. Yes, I'm very, very, very Singaporean. <laughs> very Singaporean. But I, I want to come back to this kind of the, the spectral quality of the question that he's, he's, uh, he's posed us. They, there was a film, I think I've mentioned this in a bit of culture before, it's a Peruvian film called Counter Corriente, which means the undercurrent. Or the countercurrent, you know, uh, and it's set up. Uh, the story really proceeds this way: a fisherman is married, but he falls in love with a man who is an artist. But midway, a very early part of the film, this is not a spoiler, the man dies, but he returns as a ghost, and he's living, uh, uh, living another life uh, along with his, you know, kind of real life, mm -hmm. uh, and he's having to make choices uh, that have to do with. This, this ghost, this, uh, this memory of somebody, and it has a material effect on his life. And so the, it's not that he retreats into some sort of fantasy world for a part of his day. It is that the fantasy of the spectral dimension of, of memory and feeling and all that actually forces him to make choices uh, later on in the film. And, and that was really kind of powerful because it wasn't a kind of feel-good gay film. It, it really was a film that tried to explore uh, the way in which we deal with our memories and, and the people in our lives, whether they're there or not. I mean, they can kind of somehow leave and yet have a tremendous yeah. uh, power over us. You know? mm. But I sometimes wonder, uh, I just realized that, and I think we probably surely all have this, is that I often think there are things that we probably all should have we all should be experiencing, and I discover that actually that's not the case. Um, like what? Well, like for instance, I, I've always just assumed that people um, have this sort of questions about the parallel lives, as it were, or, or you were saying about choices, you know, it was a choice that I made, and as you're saying that, I'm thinking, I didn't even realize it was a choice. I didn't even know that I had a choice. I just thought it was imposed upon me. Events happen, imposed upon me, I just have to then cope with what's been given to me. I have no choice. Um, and so it, it's a surprise to me sometimes to discover that I, that I, you know, my way of framing it was com is completely, my, uh, it's not shared with all people. Um, I didn't know there were choices in, in academic life. I thought, you turn up for your exams <laughs> without having done any work, oh. you, you, in my case. Uh, and, and you just have a go and, and then they tell you that you've done badly and they say, okay, well, I'll be off then. <laughs> I didn't know you could go back mm. again. I want to come back to the, 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 the way in which um, something in that parallel life can be um, a counterpoint or could have some real effect on the way you think about your present life. Say, for instance, in the death of your dad, right? Um, what is it? to live without a father. And, you know, maybe, you know, we've, we've talked about this before, your search for a father, father figures, right? These are things that are very important to kind of fill that uh, void, as it were, in your life. And, and that those, and then through them, your father speaks. Because in some ways, you're having a dialogue with them, with your, with your father figures, whether they mm. recognize it or mm. not. I mean, yes, I'm yeah. sure John Lennon had no idea you were his father figure, and you know, that mm. he was having conversation with yeah, you. Yeah. But his, yeah, his lawyers certainly knew. <laughs> no, no, you're right. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Th and that's an, that's an interesting mm. thing, because I, th I think we do have conversations with our other selves. I, I constantly, you know, as you know, uh, and this is a bit of biographical detail. I, I, was, I had to leave Singapore 16 years ago. And what if I stayed? You know, and what kind of person would I have become? So much of the, the, my intellectual and personal development over the last 16 years has, has been due to the kinds of things that Malaysia affords, you know, uh, open political space, the kind of contestations. And, 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 uh, but I talk to my other self, my Singaporean self, and, I, you know, and that does have some mm. effect on me. Well, um, 
we, we, we have to wrap up this particular section now, folks. And sorry if we're a, a lot more personal than we usually are. Um, uh, very different quality. Uh, being, in, being in Singapore re- encourages uh, introspection. <laughs> <laughs> a retreat into the self. <laughs> Uh, yeah, probably. Um, but in a moment, we shall be returning with topics uh, two and three here on A Bit of Culture, BFM 89.9. BFM 89.9, A Bit of Culture with myself, Cam Ruslan, Sharad Kutan, and Huzir Sulaiman. And uh, just to remind you folks, we're in Singapore this week, and also we are on video. So you can catch us if you really have to. You can watch us too. Uh, but uh, pre- uh, preferably you should just stick with the video, uh, the radio. So, uh, topic number two, the making of alternative culture. Okay, so i It sounds a big thing. No, you? I mean, I'm not talking... It's not theoretical. It's, it's very it's, frightening. <laughs> it's really about my experience in Singapore in the mm-hmm. 80s and what constituted the alternative youth culture at the time. It revolved around a magazine called Big O, Before I Get Old, and it also uh, it was sort of it had its locus and things uh, in institutions like Singapore Poly, rather than the university where I went to, and because in some ways, uh, kids at the Polytechnic were slightly marginal. You know, they weren't part of the grand narrative of Singapore success. They were kind of like okay, they'll be the foot soldiers. The kids from the National University of Singapore were going to be the generals. They were going to, or actually the kids who were scholars and sent off to Cambridge and you know, Ivy League colleges were going to be the generals, and we were going to be maybe second uh, in command. But you were, you were NUS, so you were not poly. I was NUS. Right. But you could see that the poly kids had a lot of energy. And the energy went into, uh, or maybe came from rather, uh, a place of marginality, of feeling slightly... Uh, decentered from the main project, right? So they they had they were weird. They could be creepy. They could be, you know, they dressed and costumed themselves in ways that um, uh, NUS kids never. I mean, NUS kids generally wore pants and a polo T-shirt. You know, they were. Um, in fact, kids uh, from the kind of what you might call the paikia, you know, the kind of working class Chinese uh, uh, community or class rather, they, they were much more interesting. And a professor of mine, Chua Benguat, I remember he gave a talk during lunchtime to some students about dress and how in many ways the Paikia kids had much more interesting sectorial sensibilities than we did as university kids. And why was that? Um, but uh, and I, I think that as a consequence, I mean, being at NUS, but looking at them and thinking, wow, why are they so creative? Why are they so, why don't they, don't they care about what other people think. Uh, and it led me to, to want to explore things in Singapore in history, including uh, a group that was from a different time, in, very, in many ways from, with a different purpose, which was the Singapore Research and, and Urban Planning Group. Uh, sorry. Yeah, so that was Spur. They were called Spur. And they produced two journals, and one of them was in 1974, one was a little earlier. But they came at a point where the PAP, the People's Action Party, was such a dominant force and had established itself as a dominant force by the end of the 60s, and they were trying to pro- provide uh, an alternative way of thinking about Singaporean development. Uh, they were the people, in fact, responsible in many ways for thinking about the need to move the airport, which was kind of in the center of Singapore, to Changi. Mm-hmm. They had many, many ideas. They were made up of urban planners, architects, sociologists. They were both Singaporean and uh, foreigners. Um, but they were seen as a threat, and as a consequence, they were suppressed. Um, because, they, because they wanted to move the airport? No, because they were an, uh, a center of intellectual uh, influence mm-hmm. other than the PAP. Okay. So and they that, they were like Kevin Bacon in Footloose. <laughs> Turn, turning up with dancing to that terrible rock and roll music. Just just speaking the language I understand. That's all. No, all right. no, they weren't quite because in that he's an outsider who uh, comes in with different influences. He comes he talks about reading Kurt Vonnegut's Lot of House Five, he's you know, which is a book that they're burning in the town. So no, that's slightly different. They're actually part of Singapore. Oh right. Okay. At a time when Singapore's uh, kind of p- power configuration was still quite fluid. But uh, definitely solidifying around the, P- the PAP. Mm-hmm. Now, um, I was very interested in that history, but uh, when I was growing up, that wasn't the case. PAP was firmly entrenched. And what you had was the emergence of these 
kind of alternative cultures, right? And the big old people represented that. But it came through the idiom of youth culture, of of you know being, you know, and that's for before I get old. The idea this, this, is once you get old, you're somehow going to be conservative mainstream. This is pretty much a, a sort of kind of pre-internet age, really, wasn't it? Uh, In the mid '80s, it definitely, yeah, it yeah. was an actual magazine, and they didn't always have progressive values. I remember writing angry letters to them because they didn't like. Uh, that guy, Jackson Brown, this American folk singer who was very pro uh, the Sandinistas in Nicaragua, or very anti right. the Contra, you know, the Contras. And so I wrote, you know, in, in defense of Jackson Brown, though I didn't really care for his music, but in defense of the idea of, you know, the progressive politics, yeah, 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 yeah. you know, but it was a mix of people, all of them feeling they didn't want to fall in line with anybody. And but but uh, just to, to draw uh, who's here into this, uh, you moved here in 2001, mm. but did you have a, were you aware of any of these uh, Singapore stories before you arrived? Vaguely. I mean, in the sense that my mum comes from a, a, a Singapore family, so she has sort of siblings and I have cousins and I have a set of, uh, set of grandparents in, 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 in Singapore. So as a child, I'd spent school holidays with my grandparents or aunties and uncles. So I sort of, as a kid, uh, at stages, you know, once or twice a year, sort of had a little window into Singapore culture. And I was, of course, vaguely aware of um, uh, uh, Big O, but, but I, don't, I, mean, I didn't really participate in it. But what I, I mean, the sense that I've gotten, you know, since engaging with the youth of Singapore and actually, interestingly enough, seeing some of my former students themselves go on to be secondary school teachers and then hearing their reports about what, let's say, the 15-year-olds are up to now, it, is that... Culture has always been left to... Culture in Singapore has always been alternative. There, is, there isn't a sense of the, main, the mainstream culture. I mean, I would argue, right? In, in that, uh, in the, 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 the PAP's kind of project of nation building back then in the 70s, 80s, and now they've done a complete sort of 180 degree turn, right? Um, their project sort of almost explicitly excluded culture as unimportant. It was about uh, manufacturing, it was about technology, then later it was about you know, the knowledge economy and information. Mm. It's a very technocratic. Yeah, yeah. Ex extremely technocratic. Yeah. Um, and you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's produced what it's produced. I mean, it's been extremely effective um, in, in the terms of reference that it's set for itself. Yeah. Uh, so I would argue that, I mean, one could argue, I don't know whether I... I would take the time to, um, <laughs> is, is that any, any cultural production was by definition alternative. Well, I don't, see, I would disagree. Because, because it was, there were no kind of like, you know, state magazines. I mean, but yeah, well, they, in the early the days, they, they were. There was a magazine called Towards Socialism, believe it or not. Okay, but okay, that, but okay that, that was like in the 60s. Yeah. But I think it, it, Singapore produced a, 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 a culture the, and cultural values or they wanted they extol some cultural values they felt were going to support this industrialization developmentalist uh, track that they want they had them they wanted people to keep time they wanted people to keep their hair short they want people to be disciplined there were okay. all kinds of disciplinary cultures now the if flip you're side using that broad yeah, yeah. that broad definition Same of culture, culture. Okay. On the flip side, what you had was censorship. So anything that undermined those values were then, and this way it affects the art, affected mm. the arts, because as soon as the arts dabbled in things that mm. seemed alternative, uh, that seemed that might be liberal mm. or you know or decadent, pers persuasive. Yeah, or and so we have in fact a, a major moment in Singaporean history. Um, uh, you know, the, uh, D, uh, the DJ Enright affair in 1960. Now, the professor of history that comes to Singapore, and he gives in his professorial, sto uh, professorial speech, um, he talks about Eliot and modernism or something like that, but he also talks about yellow culture. And Singapore mm -hmm. uh, and the PAP government had an anti-yellow culture campaign, mm -hmm. and he argued against that, and he said it was not the business of uh, government to get involved in the making of culture. Mm -hmm. So I think that you can argue, even though, as you say it rightly, it's a broader sense of culture, but it does impact the arts because of the censoring power of the state against what it sees as values that are alternative. And in fact, in the late 80s and early 90s, you had this discourse of alternative culture, right, and alternative mm -hmm. values. But what's interesting now, Sharad, is that uh, when many, not all, huh, but many of these restrictions and the, uh, have, been, have been sort of scaled back, of course, mm -hmm. on the books and the regulations sort of remain there, ready to be uh, enforced if, if, if the winds change. 
um, you, you actually see uh, uh, some, some might say, a dumbing down of the types of things that, that, that come out because there isn't that challenge to say what you want to say uh, under the censor's eye and get away with it. I mean, it's the same thing after the Iron Curtain fell uh, in theatre prior to that under communism had flourished in all the the Warsaw Pact states Mm. uh, because it was a way of saying things in a coded uh, way that would escape the censors and you know a lot of mm. theatrical and literary creativity was deployed in making sure that you got your message across. Poetry, across. Yeah, a lot it, of poetry. It, well, exactly, but as, uh, but as soon as, uh, I mean I say this from a theatre practitioner's perspective because that's, you know, that's my industry, so and as soon as, as, soon as the, the, the communism fell, people stopped going to the theatre because that was not the place that they could go to get anything interesting. Mm. So theatre artists had to scramble to, to, re, to try and remain relevant when you could get Western films and TV and Levi's and Nikes and mm. you know, designer drugs and designer fashions and, and all of those things. No, I, no I, I do agree. I mean, what happens when you have regime change? And I think in Singapore, it's, perhaps, it's not been so much regime change, but a regime, rethinking. Regime change in Singapore in the same <laughs> sentence. <laughs> Somebody's going to be banging at the but, door now. But certainly <laughs> the, the administration has, has rethought, and it might be Richard Florida and his, and his mm. thesis about mm. the creative class. Um, we've talked about that before. Mm. Uh, but you know, whatever it is that was the impulse behind this liberalization, mm. uh, you know, is that, yes, artists now have to find um, a new way of talking. If one was speaking elliptically before, now you, have, you can say, well, I can now speak directly to the politics, but you still have to find the poetry in it. Whereas if the, you know, the strategy before kind of forced you to be poetic, now you have to sort of think, okay, mm-hmm. if it's, is it too just in your face? No, no, I mean, and what are your other concerns? It, it, what it forces you to do as an artist, it... It does does the condition of censorship or the situation of censorship actually give you a ready-made audience who is willing to listen to those things? And once you remove the censorship, uh, there's th- that kind of transgressive thrill is gone. But well, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps on on the stage. But uh, yes, the audience does go find some, find it somewhere else. But they're always looking for the answers. Mm. It just it just maybe to, sadly for the theatre practitioner, they are no longer the people who can. Uh, su- able to supply because because you can get it in sexier forms somewhere else. The other side of this alternative culture, we, uh, just very quickly, is to say, you know, the, the people behind before I get old or big old have now become old. We're all in our forties and our fifties, and I'm actually interested in the personal personal transformations of those youth rebels, you know, those looking for an alternative, who remain true to a, a kind of spirit. Okay, mm. we've all become older, but do we still have that kind of kick-ass, you know, culturally, you know, critical, you know, uh, insights into our own society, and that, that remains so relevant, I think. Right, right. So the Singapore story can, uh, moves on. See, I, I, I don't really know Singapore as well as you two. Uh, we need to move on to the next topic. Can I just ask very quickly, so is there really such a thing as a Singapore mindset separate from other places are Singaporeans Singaporean <laughs> yes they are they, they are they, they, they are separate but what They're makes different. a Singaporean and exactly Singaporean the thing is how, how, how did they get to be that and surely the way they got to be that was through culture and who programmed the culture and who gave them the culture who allowed the culture I mean that's that's the dominant culture and everything okay. else will be an alternative to it. I think there's it. one okay, one quick, quick thing. I think we too often blame or credit the People's Action Party for things that have happened or, or things that make Singapore Singapore. Um, and I think that's one danger, you know, that comes from a kind of liberal mindset when looking at the problems of cultural development in Singapore. No, oh, okay. We're, okay. we're too quick to, right. to blame them. All right. Bless Give them credit. Bless them. So um, we're going to move now to topic number three, uh, which... It is a topic that's true for all three of us here, and I'm sure for many of you out there. The Malaysian abroad. Jose, you are now a Malaysian abroad. I am a Malaysian abroad. Do you carry yourself with dignity? I try to. You do us proud? I try to, (laughs) um, though I have not yet managed to make it for the various Malaysian High Commission functions uh, that they invite me to by email, having dutifully registered as a Malaysian citizen. They always organize Malaysian citizen get-togethers and... and, and quite fun affairs, I understand they are. But no, I, I, I've not managed to, to go for any of those. But no, the thing about being a Malaysian abroad, particularly in Singapore, is that 
one comes to realize just how many uh, Singaporeans are Malaysian, uh, how, ma how many Malaysians there are here, how mm. many how many Singaporeans were recently Malaysian, or how many Sing Singaporeans parents were uh, Malaysian, um, and it's it's quite interesting. I mean, we were mentioning before the break about uh, whether there is a Singaporean mindset, and it's kind of interesting that that you can sometimes tell a former Malaysian. They, to all intents and purposes, they're Singaporean and they carry the passport and da da da. But you know, after an hour of conversation, or if you're working with them after about two weeks of work, you kind of sort of figure this. There's something about diff bit different about this person. And you realize, oh, they were Malaysian before, and then they're now and they're now Singaporean. And what um, is it that you you um, detect? What is it that I detect? Okay. Malaysians, it would appear, and this becomes apparent when they're abroad, uh, I think it th throws it into sharp relief, I think are, are, are less concerned about the proper way of doing things. They want to get something done, but the method that they employ in order to achieve those results uh, may be entirely irregular or improvised. Oh, yes. they're little mothers. Um, no. it, let's let's take no. well. I mean, if you want to use that in a positive sense, I, though, as I said, from you, I don't think, uh, I, don't think, <laughs> I, don't think I don't think it, you mean it that way. But yeah, I mean, there there is a there is a talent for sort of improvisation, for making the best of things, for finding a creative solution that I think Malaysians bring to the table. Whether you know they're servicing planes in an airport in Germany or they're um, a technocrat in, in in Singapore or an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. A lot of Penangites in in, in Singapore. Yeah, too. I yeah. think partly in the Hokkien thing. But I think yeah. I, I was told by because my cousins are, are Penangites and and they tell me that you kind of get a free pass in in Singapore from from Penang. They're like, oh, okay, you suddenly you're sort of a, a better class of <laughs> Malaysian because yeah, oh, you're, yeah. you're instantly meant to have sort of entrepreneurial skills. You're meant to be sort of dynamic and. Yeah. and I'm and, from Joe and, Baru, so I can yeah. see I'm, yeah. I'm a lower yeah. class. <laughs> the <laughs> class, exactly. The lowest of the low, yeah, right? But exactly. as a Malaysian abroad, and we've all three of us been Malaysian abroad. Um, do, do you find you have do you do you feel a need to carry yourself in a certain way? Um, see, in Singapore, you can kind of pass a little bit. In fact, they explicitly include you as Singaporeans in certain things. I went to the last general elections in in two thousand and eleven. Um, in Singapore, one of the big election issues was the perception that there was uncontrolled immigration. So all these people from uh, the, the People's Republic of China and you know. Um, perhaps from South Asia coming in and quote unquote stealing the jobs of Singaporeans and creating sort of social problems and so on. So I went to a rally of uh, the Workers' Party in, in Aljunid, um, a, a constituency in which they actually triumphed and they unseated the PAP. Uh, and a lot of the rhetoric was very disturbingly xenophobic. Mm. It was very, very, you know, uh, these foreigners, da, 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 these foreigners, these foreigners, this foreigners, that. And I told the Singaporean friends that I was with them as we left. And it makes me feel very uncomfortable. No, no, they don't mean Malaysians. <laughs> no, no, they don't mean Malaysians. Malaysians are in a special category of almost Singaporeans if they were only if they were only sort of shave and, and wash. You know, <laughs> regularly. We could, we could, yeah, we could. Who's here? You, you can let the side down. Yeah. Um, but, so yeah, so yeah. that's it's, that's the interesting thing in in, yeah. but in that, Singapore. I mean, that I mean, Malay. But what about in England? Yeah, because it is the thing is Malaysia, Singapore. There are there are few countries in the world more uh, similar with a closer history than Malaysia, Singapore. So to be a Malaysian in Singapore is different. When you go further away, mm. though, then it becomes. Um, I don't. Know, I mean, I, I grew up in in England, and I was always aware of myself as a Malaysian, um, and I, I I never looked to get a British passport or anything. But for me, it was, uh, I mean, I knew, I, I knew Malaysia and I came back very occasionally, but um, it was just to be something removed. So there was the norm. And I had this phrase, which I used to say in those days, which was, you know, everybody's English. Uh, of course, they're not, I discovered. But everyone seemed to be English. And so to be Malaysian, therefore, was to just not be part of the main, uh, main culture. And, and I, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that. So perhaps... For me, it wasn't so much. It wasn't until later that I became more aware of Malaysianness and Malaysian traits, and and stood up for those. I came to Singapore, unlike you, as a you know, I came as a child, and so when I grew up here, I really didn't have a strong sense of what Malaysia was in reality. Yeah, and so for me, Malaysia then became a space of some sort of fantasy. I. I thought of Malaysia as something that was not Singapore. Mm. You know, I imagine, and by the time I got to university, I was reading Aliran, and for me, 
Aliran was Malaysia, you know, and I thought that this was what was going on in Malaysia. And I had, you know, very, very positive views of the country. So I wasn't so much a Malaysian thinking I'm carrying a Malaysian flag and I'm representing Malaysia in Singapore. It, my whole relation, the whole question of being Malaysian was really about a projection into the future or another space. I was thinking about this space of freedom, of, you know, the possibilities of, you know, active political participation. Mm. I mean, it was... You know, it was bizarre, I mean, you know, because I lived in, in the 80s in Singapore where, you know, the government had not decided where it wanted to go in terms of opening up space. And so I felt very constrained here. Um, but s Malaysia was this, this wonderful Yeah, uh, I, yeah no, and I, I, I heard this, uh, he's Australian of Malaysian descent, both parents from Sabah. Um, and he's very fascinated by his Malaysianness. Although he is, you know, very Australian, and he was saying that as he was growing up, he imagined that Malaysia was this land where people would just stop in the street and be able to compose a pantun like like that, and so you know. Uh, uh, well, uh, can't you? <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which, I wanted to ask you, Jose. I mean, you work here. You worked in Malaysia. You know, being outside of Malaysia, does that change the way you create your art? I mean, is there something yeah. about something yeah. about Malaysia and our politics, our culture, our debates, our, you know, our passions? And your connection to it. I mean, you know, your, your card-carrying connection to it. Because now you are not card-carryingly connected to the Singapore story, if you know what I mean. Mm. Well, okay. The funny thing is, I think being card-carryingly connected, as you call it, doesn't actually help I mean for about from about the end of 2006 to the early to the beginning of 2009 I was writing a fortnightly column for the star and as a consequence I felt the need to keep myself abreast of what was going on in Malaysia so I was living the sort of online life of every Malaysian so I read every online Malaysian news portal whether mainstream or alternative um, and I sort of followed the news assiduously and tried to keep up with the gossip so that I could make sure that the column that I was writing, which was for, which was on Malaysian subjects for a Malaysian audience, except in the rare cases where I talked about Singapore, um, was, was, was not irrelevant. Um, but I, so it's possible in today's age, right? Because I'm sort of consuming the same media. Now, arguably, I didn't have the same experiences. Like I couldn't step out of my door and see the pavement cracked. I mean, the pavement is in good repair when I step out of, of, mm -hmm. of the door. And, um, and there's perhaps a bit less haze at times, and people seem to <laughs> obey, obey the traffic rules with, uh, with a you know, greater amount of... Uh, Are you trying to shame us, Jose? No, no, I'm, no I'm not, really not, not at all. But I'm, I'm saying, I'm, you know, there's, there's that level of, of what I acknowledge constitutes the, the difference of the, the psychic experience. But in a sense, as an emigre writer, I was still able to write a newspaper column um, without too many people sure. saying, you, don't, you have nothing to say, even yeah. though you, you don't I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by what you said, because I might, I might be finding myself in the same situation soon. But the thing is, that you, when I think back at the work that you did in, in, in Malaysia, the plays you did... Are you moving to Singapore? No, not, not Singapore. Not Singapore. Uh, but um, you, the work showed that you really cared about the mm. place that you were writing out. You know, election day... Mm -hmm. You know, you cared hmm. about what was happening. Mm -hmm. Can you? Can you? That, that that's that's a part of you that that needs to be fulfilled, surely. So yeah. now you're in Singapore. Are you are you able to release that part, exercise that part that cares about the land in which you live? Can I interject before you jump in there? I I want to say that I think that what I notice about people who are very connected, you know, there are people who write to like Malaysia Kini or something constantly, but they live in Australia, for instance. Mm. And what I feel about them is that when when they live in this world of online uh, political portals and engage with the politics of the day through, through this me medium alone, what it's only the negative. It's only the negative. Only the they only get the toxic stuff. That's right. right. Very, yeah. very And there is yeah. so much that is, yeah. that is about pleasure, about, you know, things that actually redeem exactly. Malaysia exactly. that happen outside of politics exactly. on Absolutely. the streets. That, and that's the distinction that I'm trying to make because I yeah. realize that you can't just go in. I mean, you know, Singapore coffee shops are wonderful, but like the, the pleasures of a Malaysian coffee shop are incomparable, I think. Mm. And you don't, you don't get that when you just have an online access. But yeah. I, I, do want, I do want to address your question because I think it's, it's, it's a very... It's a very powerful one. Um, I, I have found a way to, to care about the things that I am allowed to care about. Um, so, I mean, I do identify myself as a Singapore artist. I have been sort of embraced by this, the, the Singapore uh, theatre and, and, and arts community. The National Arts Council is very kind to me. 
um, I'm reaching that sort of stage of rotundity and, and, and decrepitude <laughs> where I'm invited to sit on sort of committees and, and, and things like that. So I just go and do my quote unquote national service. But I mean, I also acknowledge that, you know, I am a guest. And so I sort of follow that same, the same set of rules that you go, if you're a guest in someone's house, you don't sort of criticize mm, the mm. furniture. But I do find the things mm. that I can genuinely celebrate about this place. I mean, postcode Singapore, postcode SG, that, um, that, 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 that I publish an editorial director of, I think you know, explicitly is there to celebrate uh, a Singapore in transition. I mean, there's many, there's many it, it looks at things from a very thoughtful and reflective, and I hope the larger project encourages critique, but it's not going out there to find fault. Yeah, but, but celebrate is just the yin without the yen. We need to be able to denounce as well, don't we? What's it, mm. Correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't Kube Jedwani uh, contribute a piece to postcode? And it was all about trying to find uh, a, a place to, to live in and when, when they don't allow Indians. That's right. right. And it was a beautiful piece. I yeah. really enjoyed that. And, and I think maybe that answers your question. It's okay. not it's a not, pure, pure it's not, kind of mindless it's not jingoism. celebration. It's not rah-rah. It's not sort of Pollyannish. I mean, I don't pretend... No, no, no. no, no, no. Postcode, people write into Postcode and do that thing, right? But I'm just saying you personally, you, yes. you within your own self, I mean, yes. to, to, to scream out loud and say, um, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. Mm -hmm. Vis-a-vis -vis the country, because I mean, you, you, your work with in in Malaysia was very biting, mm -hmm. um, it, and it was loving as well. But that's the thing you can you can shout at your own mother and father, but you damn well don't, don't you go and miss shout that. Some, but I can go home and shout at you know. Yeah, because I, 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 I ask because I, as I say, I might be finding myself I'm in not, the same situation. I'm not locked up in Singapore. Uh, I mean, I, I acknowledge our hospitality. I, I sort of contribute in an intelligent way. I mean, I'm not. I, I, anyone who looks at my work here will know there's a lot of, there's a lot of critique of Singapore society in uh, The Way to Silk on Skin uh, in 2011, in Cogito 2007. They look at um, some of the darker aspects of Singapore society. Mm. And, but, but it's, I think, the, the encoded uh, things that are in culture and society that are not explicitly party political. Uh, sure. So, I mean, just because I don't address party political issues, okay. I mean, I don't uh, talk about PAP figures the way I would talk about Barca national figures in Malaysia, yeah. um, doesn't mean that I don't have a perspective on, on Singapore society that is, that is loving in the fullest sense of the word, in which I acknowledge its uh, shadows and dark parts and, 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 and things that I think could, could do with a bit of change. No, no. We, we, we really have to move on. We, we've overextended there. It's, it's fascinating to talk about, so I, I, I let us go. So, but we have to move on. Uh, in a moment, we will be back with recommendations here on A Bit of Culture, BFM 89.9. BFM 89.9, A Bit of Culture, and now the final part, recommendations, where we recommend something that uh, we've come across that we think might be of interest. I'm going to go first, and I want to recommend, inspired by Husea Suleiman's apartment, uh, uh, collecting art. Husea, he must, when he was in, living in Malaysia, he picked up some of the best art around, and... You've got uh, Wong Hoi Chong's here, two Wong Hoi Chong's. Uh, That's Yi Ilan. Yi Ilan. Uh, is that Sydney? Sydney town up there? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I mean, this is not an invitation to any sort of burglars to, 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 because we're not going to tell you address. But I mean, you must have got these at a good price back in the day. Well, no. No, they were expensive <laughs> then. And that piece over there is back, actually yours. Back in, what? The piece over there. Yeah, you actually the, did. That's yeah. a Jose. That's an original Jose. Yeah. Mm. yeah. That was painted uh, during rehearsals for um, Notes on Life and Love and Painting. No, oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, you may have spent a bit of money back then, but now these pieces are worth a lot more. If it money is, of course, what you're interested in. No, not at all. I just, you know, I think both my wife and I would just buy things that we love and, and we don't really think they will ever sell it. Right, right. So, uh, folks, my recommendation is go out there and, and ask questions and look around and find out what, what is the art that's happening uh, in your hometown and you go collect it, you buy it, support your local artist because you will be thankful later that you bought those pieces as I am angry with myself that I did not buy these pieces when I had the chance. And the money. And the money back in the day. <laughs> I wish I had these pieces, but anyway. But I know you have a beautiful Hoichong. You have an enormous Hoichong. I, I, Hoichong oil, which is very rare. I, I, I got, I, I'm very fortunate. I do have one, um, but I, I do love these. Uh, there's one over there with my favorite piece uh, by him. Uh, it's a kind of map where he, he uh, makes London and Georgetown kind of this one and the same place. And it's, it's really beautiful. I wish I had that. Um, so that's my recommendation. Go collect art. You'll thank yourself in, in times to come. Um, Sharad, 
What's yours? Uh, I just want to recommend some things that uh, kind of Singaporean. Uh, one is the novel Saint Jack by Paul Thoreau, uh, which was written in 1973. It was made into a film in 1979. It was banned in 1980. And in 2006, the ban was lifted, partly because uh, it's a story of Singapore in seedier times. And the protagonist is a pimp. Oh. Uh, and I also want to mention uh, a couple of uh, films that I think uh, are worth looking at, Singaporean films. I think they re do reflect something of uh, the theme I, of youth culture and, and alternative culture that I mentioned earlier. One is Eating Air and the other is 15 by Royston Tan. I can't remember who did Eating Air. Uh, though both of them deal with that underclass, the Singaporeans, the Paikia, the kind of Chinese working class youth uh, and their troubles. It's a, they're, they're, I find them actually quite moving though a lot of Singaporean friends of mine didn't like 15. Uh, so Eating Air, 15, uh, I think really worth having a look at. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Uh, uh, who's there? And I want to recommend um, two books. Uh, the novel that I've, that I've recently read and, and enjoyed, um, the novel 1Q84 by Haruki Murakami, uh, which actually explores the, 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 the theme of parallel lives, which we talked about earlier, and sort of parallel worlds and alternative realities. And it's masterfully uh, plotted uh, and involves you know, both a male and a female protagonist. That we st they start out being, their stories being told separately and then they eventually um, converge. Uh, very gripping. It's a massive, massive book, but really unputdownable, as they say. Um, and the second is a nonfiction book called uh, Quiet by Susan Cain, which is subtitled The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking. Because um, I've always sort of realized that I was an introvert, but yet I'm also engaged with the public in, 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 in certain things, in the performing arts. I give talks, I teach, whatever. Um, so I was trying to you know, get an insight into myself. And it's a really very, very insightful book to, for anyone who has in, introverted tendencies or deals with people who are introverted to kind of understand and, and make the best of, mm -hmm. of one's own proclivities in a world that seems to demand constant... Uh, self-promotion and, and engagement with, with the rest of, of mm. the universe. Of course, That's which is quiet. what we're doing right now, actually. <laughs> quiet, is it? Quiet, by quiet. Susan Keynes. Uh -huh. Okay, and then the first book? Uh, 1Q84 by Haruki Murakami. Okay, okay. Uh, well, uh, so I, bring, I, I call to an end this week's uh, episode of A Bit of Culture. I want to thank uh, Husea Suleiman. Thank you. And Sherrod Hutton. Yeah, always a pleasure. Um, and myself, Cam Rustland. I have to say the two of you um, have, you know, you, you make Singapore sound interesting. It's very interesting. It is interesting. No, you're right. It is interesting. And I think that actually the things that are happening in Singapore, it, it, it is an interesting place. It'd be very interesting to see how things happen and transpire out here. Um, and, but yeah, the connections between Malaysia and Singapore are so intense. Uh, I don't feel... Uh, I don't, yeah, I don't feel uh, like a foreigner here. But, um, so thank you very much. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch with us, please do so on our Twitter feeds. Mine's at Cam Rusland. Sherrod's is? At Sherrod Kutten. Jose, do you have a Twitter feed? I do. I very rarely tweet, but it's Jose Salam. At Jose Salam. Yeah, Jose Salam. Okay, do. And uh, it only remains for me now to, as is traditional, we end with a piece of music, which is chosen by our special honoured guest. Uh, Jose, do you have a piece of music? Um, yes, I have chosen... Tub thumping by Chumba. Oh my goodness! <laughs> <laughs> could you could you come? <coughs> yes, I know because it would provoke that that that, uh, that look. Just a, just a little sample <coughs> of your own sort no, of. I, I don't think I would. Any, any particular reason why, Jose? Um, you know, because I felt we needed uh, a bit of energy. It's as, joyous, as, you know, yeah, as we headed to lunch. Okay, great. All right, tub thumping by Chumba Wumba. Uh, <laughs> plays us out here <laughs> on a special Singapore and video version of A Bit of Culture here on BFM 89.9, the Singapore station. <laughs>